Well, welcome to worship. Welcome to Life on Mission. We have, um, we're at step number four today. And our Lord Jesus Christ said to us, you will be our wit my witnesses in Jer Judea, Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, our mission is to be a witness of the truth that Jesus Christ is Savior of the world. That's what this series has been about. How are we to do that? How are we to be witnesses? And I've, like I've said from the beginning, it's simpler than you think. It doesn't take a PhD in theology to be a witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's simply being who we have been made to be in Christ as we live out our lives as Christians. Now, the first step, like I said, was to connect. In other words, form relationships, make friends, um, you know, learn new people. The analogy here was like inviting people into your backyard. Step two was serving them, loving them. The analogy here was like inviting people into your home. Step three was share, telling other people about how, what Jesus means to you and what Jesus has, how he has changed your life. The analogy there is sharing a meal with them. Today, like I said, is step four grow. The analogy here is going beyond just feeding a meal to a person, but taking them to the kitchen and teaching them to cook for themselves as well. One night several years ago, Diane and I, uh, my, Diane's my wife, um, we stopped at a family video to just get a movie to see what, uh, just to have a good Friday night, just relax and do nothing. And the movie that we chose for that evening was Sylvester Stallone's Cliffhanger. And, you know, it's a movie about mountain climbing, and it's, they're in the dead of winter. You know, most of the climbers are in parkas and in heavy jackets, <laughs> but not Stallone. He always has his shirt off. I mean, four or five times in this movie, he has his shirt off. And in this one scene that they have on, that, on the uh, movie thing there, the, uh, the jacket, you know, he's hanging off to ropes. His biceps and triceps are bulging. His abs are rippling off that. And, and Diane kind of looks at it, and then she turns and looks at me, and she looks at the screen again and looks at me and I'm sprawled out on the crowd. She looks at the movie again and then kind of looks at me and says, you know, I've never been attracted to well-built men. <laughs> I didn't really know how to take that at first, you know. So I, I, I tried to search for the compliment that I thought was lying underneath <laughs> there, but never really found one. <laughs> The truth is, is that there is no such thing as a well-built man. That's just baloney. I mean, maybe if you're age 20, men and women are naturally well-built, but if you don't keep working at it, you're not going to be there very long. The truth is, is that there are well-trained people, not well-built people. And, you know, you can, you, I mean... Being trained is, is one thing. I mean, even look at Stallone here. Look at him between the Rocky movies and Rambo and Cliffhanger. I mean, if there was a guy who was well, well, we know he was more than well trained. He was well injected as well. But you get my drift there. You know, we just don't, if you want to change anything in your life, you've got to train. I mean, Nobody just wakes up with bigger biceps one day. Nobody just gets up and runs a marathon. Is there anyone here that could go out and run a marathon, not just walk, run every step of a marathon right now? Anyone? Oh, one guy back here thinks he can do it. <laughs> but how many of you think that eventually, if you train, you could do it? You know, there are, see, there are. I think most of us could, if we trained, do it. Not that I would ever want to, because running's kind of stupid anyway. You know, who went, it's let alone 26 miles. I mean, you know, there's those people that have those stickers 13.1, 26.2 on their cars. I want one that has 0.0. .0. I don't run. That's what I want. I mean, if God wanted us to run, he would have given us four legs, right? But anyway, I think eventually many of us here could run a marathon if we wanted to, if we trained for it. I mean, 
look at Oprah. She did it. And if Oprah can do it, I think almost every one of us here <laughs> could do it if we trained for it. The key is training. Now, like I've said many times already, God has given us one job as Christians. Why we're still alive on this earth. There's only two things that we can do on earth that we can't do in heaven. One is sin. You can't sin in heaven. And the other one is to tell others about Jesus. He's given us one job, and that one job is to be a witness. We're not to be a judge. We're not to be a defense lawyer, um, you know, defending Jesus, although knowledge of your faith is really good. We're not to be a prosecuting attorney, beating people over the heads with the Bible, although, again, having that knowledge of the faith is good for you. We are given one job to be a witness. And I found some more one-job pictures for us here. You had one job. I believe a gate is supposed to limit access. You have one job. Paint the disability decal right. I mean, what kind of disability is that? You have one job. I don't think Jewish people celebrate Christmas. You have one job. Put the cheese on top of the hamburger, <laughs> not on top of the bun. You have one job. Know the difference between watermelons and pumpkins. You can't be a witness unless you connect with people. You can't get, get them to listen to you unless you love them and serve them. You can't speak the tr good news unless you share the gospel with them. And you can't grow as a witness unless you train. But why grow? Why train? Well, the first reason is that there's really no other option. You're a living organism. You're either growing or you're dying. There's no other halfway in between that. You're either growing or you're dying. Every cell in your body is growing. Even adults are growing, mostly more outward than upward now, but we're still growing. Every day, millions of cells are replaced in growth. And did you know that every five to seven years, every cell in your body is replaced? Every cell. But if you're not in training, that strong muscle cell is not going to be replaced with another strong muscle cell. St. Paul says to us that God knows what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives, to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. And St. Paul then says again, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So a living faith is a growing faith. And the second reason of why you train is because it's the only way to bear fruit. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear no fruit, but in me, with me, you can bear much fruit. But what kind of fruit is Jesus talking about there? Is he talking about the fruits of the Spirit? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc. down the line. Is he talking about that kind of fruit? Or is he talking about mission, which would be the fruit of reproduction? Because isn't that what fruit is all about? All fruits have seeds, right? And the purpose of fruit is to make new plants, new trees, reproduction. I think what Jesus says means here is <laughs> both fruits of the Spirit and fruits of reproduction. They both go together. So why don't more Christians, why aren't they more interested in growing? I think one of the big reasons for us in our society is that we're just too busy and excuses abound. 
I mean, that's what the gospel lesson for this evening was all about, in which Jesus was uh, talking to people there. He says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And by implication, he doesn't talk to this guy again. So this guy must have said, well, you know, maybe that's not the best thing to do if he's got no place to go. So Jesus says to another man, follow me. And how does the man reply? The man replies, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, what Jesus was saying there is that we can have all kinds of excuses for not following Jesus, not being his witnesses. I mean, there are security issues. There are wealth and power issues. There are issues of, um, you know, of um, distractions around us. There, are, there may be fear or guilt or ideas of pampering ourselves. There are all kinds of excuses that we can use. But here's a, a general principle that usually holds true. If you pay attention to something, it will usually grow. If I pay attention to my house plants, feed and water them, they'll grow. If I pay attention to my kids, they will grow, they'll learn more. If I pay attention to my marriage, it will grow and get better. If I pay attention to my work, Usually things work out really well. And I know it doesn't hold in all situations here. Like, guys, I mean, we can't pay attention to our hair and make our hair grow. I know that. <laughs> doesn't hold true in all situations. But in general, the principle is true. We're never too busy to be witnesses because we're simply being who God has made us in Christ. And the second reason why Christians aren't more interested in growing is usually is that they don't have a trainer. How can you train if you don't have a trainer? Jesus said, the student is not above the master, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And Paul says, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. I think this is where life on mission is different than maybe some of the other things that you've heard or programs that you've heard or sermon series that you've heard in the past. A fundamental problem that we have is that with missions in the United States is that we lack relationships. It's not been, it's been missing as a part of our mission strategy. You can't be trained or be a trainer without being in a relationship. Now, to some, a relationship is optional to lead a person to Jesus Christ. But to many, the relationship is optional after you've led a person to Jesus Christ, after they've come to faith. Certainly, there are some times in our life when God just puts things in our path and makes things happen for us, you know, where like Philip and the Ethiopian, you know, where they just, people just pop up in your life and you have that opportunity to witness, you know, whether it be a seat on an airplane or a, a conversation in a coffee shop or being stuck on the interstate for an hour and a half with dead stopped traffic. You know, those situations happen. But even in those situations, there's really no excuse for talking to a person about Jesus and then not having a relationship, just letting them go all by themselves. That's why, again, Scripture says that we are to make disciples, not converts. So what is a disciple? If you look in Scripture, check this out. The word Christian occurs only three times in the New Testament. The word disciple occurs 269 times. So which do you think is more important? 
A disciple is a learner, a pupil, literally an apprentice. An apprentice is a person who learns from someone who knows. If you work in a trade, that's probably how you learned that trade. If you want to be, uh, have more muscle, if you want to lose weight, if you want to be the best you can be, it really takes a trainer because it's in that last set or that last rep when you think you can't do it, that you have someone over you standing there calling you a wimp saying, come on, you can do it. Do it just one more time. Get that last rep in. And it's that last rep that makes a difference, that helps you take it to the next level. When I'm working out at the Y, Diane, again, is my spotter there, and it's funny to watch some of the reaction of the guys around us when we're lifting there, because they, if I'm on the bench and I'm trying to lift 315, you know, they just like, they're looking, and I can do 310, and if I'm attempting 310, 15, all Diane has to do is lift five pounds, right? But they're thinking, oh no, there's no way that this lady can handle this, this lift here. But she's there, and she can lift it, and she helps me and gets that last rep in so that I can take it to the next level. This area, this action step, I think, is what most excites me because it is growing. You know, for so long in our church, we've put a division between evangelism and discipleship, as if you could do one or the other exclusively. But scripture puts them together. It doesn't just talk about making converts. It talks about making disciples. Now, maybe nobody's ever trained you, and I get that, you know. Maybe you belong to a church that didn't do anything to help with your spiritual formation. And that's a big problem for big churches. But if you're going to grow, if you're going to get better at things, you've got to train You've got to do those type of things. I mean, for most people, it's simply, you know, you come in for a sermon and you do your sermon workout once a week and do nothing else for the rest of the week. You know, in sports, we call that a weekend warrior, right? That's where someone just on a Saturday morning decides to go run a race or play a uh, highly physically demanding sport. And what they end up doing is becoming so sore that they use the rest of the week to try to get over their soreness and never advance beyond that. You know, they do their weekend warrior stuff and then, you know, uh, they, they, they don't advance because, and, and usually what they do is they end up hurting themselves too. That's probably what you see more in, uh, in ER visits on Saturday than almost anything is the weekend warrior um, athlete there. But as you can see then, um, training is important. Discipleship is important for us. And that's what we've been doing here at Ascension over the last couple years. Some of the changes that we've been made. We're shifting from just simply informational things to things that help grow the spirit, that help us connect with our Lord Jesus Christ in faith, in knowledge, in living, in discipleship. Two weeks ago, Pastor Girdle had a discipleship a, a training seminar that he hosted, and he's going to have another one in January there. We need to grow in our relationship closer to our Lord Jesus Christ to be more like him. That's why we're making those changes in junior confirmation, making the classes smaller and getting them more involved in living life as a disciple, as a Christian. It's why changes are coming in our Sunday school because again, it's more than just instruction. It's more than instructional. It's more than informational. It's transformation is what we're after. And with mission, mission is really about relationships. It's your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ that saves you, not what you can do. Relationships are what's most important to us in our life. Our relationship with our family, our relationship with our friends, and especially our relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what we're about. We're there to help you grow spiritually, to grow in discipleship, because it's that relationship that is vitally important. That's how the faith gets passed from generation to generation, from person to person. It's not about information. It's about transformation. 
It's not evangelism alone, it's discipleship. Connect, serve, share, and then grow. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.